Hello, I'm Bruce Gewertz, Surgeon in Chief and Vice Dean for Academic Affairs here at Cedar Sinai. It's my pleasure today to have a discussion with Miguel Birch, who's one of our senior general surgeons and one of the most outstanding minimally invasive surgeons in the country. Miguel, welcome. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Gewertz. It's great to be here. Uh, tell us how you uh, got interested in surgery. Where, where were you raised, and, and when did you first start thinking about going into medicine? Oh, thanks for asking. So, um, interestingly, I was born in Bolivia, which is a small country, sort of landlocked in South America. Um, I was born in the city of La Paz, which ranges in altitude between 10,000 and 14,000 feet. Um, there's a high plains desert, and between uh, somewhere in the Andes Mountains. That's where I was born and raised until I was nine. My, m my mother immigrated to the United States when, she was, when I was very young, and then after saving enough money to sort of have a family she sent for me to come up, I jumped on a plane sort of unexpectedly um, by myself and had some adventures with uh, immigration in, uh, in Miami. And then eventually they felt bad enough for me. They just put me on the plane and sent me to D.C. where I <laughs> saw my mom. So I spent the better part of that summer when I was nine years old in 1980 um, improving my English, which was very poor, by watching soap operas by day and old MASH episodes by night. And when I think back on those days, um, I think back about uh, MASH characters and really all the characters I've, I sort of got to know that summer. And the person that sticks out the most is Hawkeye Pierce, uh, a thoracic surgeon uh, in the in uh, in Korea during that time, and he he the things I really liked about him is that he was energetic, charismatic. He always did the right thing for his patients and his people, and he was a little bit irreverent. Uh, I like to push the envelope of things, and so that was the first time I started thinking of uh, of medicine at all. And uh, you know, I evolved over time, and sort of it became a much more real aspiration as I went, got to college. I went to a small school in Virginia called George Mason University and um, really awoke to the opportunities that were available to me. Um, you know, I was the first person in my family to go to college, so it felt like a, a fire hose of opportunity all over the place. Uh, eventually, I, I was able to uh, apply to medical school. I got in early admission, which allowed me to take a year and go uh, travel. So I traveled around the world for about six months. And then got finally got to uh, MCV and then eventually matriculated to my training in Boston at uh, Boston University. And as I recall, you, you did some training here at Cedars-Sinai with Dr. Phillips uh, several years ago. Yeah, I did. And it was a 2004 to 2005. I came out to be, uh, I, I fell in love with minimally invasive approaches to GI surgery. Uh, I came out here for the 2004-2005 when I was, uh, was his fellow at the really dawning of uh, the modern version of minimally invasive surgery. Yeah, so so that's what what's been so extraordinary that you've really, as l young as you are, uh, you you sort of predated uh, the use of minimally invasive surgery, and particularly in what we might call advanced uh, challenges like uh, bariatric surgery in very large people, uh, cancer surgery, gastric uh, cancer. I know you're very interested in. Uh, tell us a little bit about that that evolution since you did live through it. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, I think one of the things that became very uh, obvious to me watching the open operations, which all were, you know, we thought they were great and the patients did well, but um, they never so recovered as well as we all thought they may have. Um, there were problems with wound infections or uh, particularly for the cancer patients, those wound infections usually, you know, you have to think about cancer surgery as a pause in the chemotherapy. And so, you you know, you have to do chemotherapy before surgery and then do the surgery. And then the, you got to have a very quick and predictably good recovery to get to the latter half of your chemotherapy. And sometimes even just having a wound infection slowed that down. And so um, it was interesting to see that uh, the patients who did the best were tended to be patients who had minimally invasive surgery. Um, that's one of the reasons I came out to be with Dr. Phillips for that year was because he had been well published and uh, we all sort of admired his outcomes and I uh, came to watch, uh, watch and learn from him. That's really remarkable. What would you say, uh, it, what operation would in your mind uh, typify the, um, the biggest advantage of minimally invasive versus open surgery? 
I know uh, to, to sort of expound on that, you know, uh, when I was growing up, uh, removing a gallbladder through a five or six inch incision under the rib cage mm -hmm. was sort of the state of the art. Yeah. And uh, I remember how those poor patients suffered from that incision and how long they were actually laid up for that. And then with laparoscopic surgery, that, that made all the difference in the world since the vast majority of gallbladders are done that way. Mm -hmm. But in your area of advanced laparoscopic surgery, which procedure you think has, has benefited the most from the uh, developments in minimally invasive? I think uh, uh, any, so um, the real advantage of minimally invasive surgery, and there are many, but one of them is the fact that where you make the incision to look at the anatomy can be very distant from the anatomy you're actually operating on. And the, tough, the toughest places to operate for all surgeons, regardless of whether it's minimally invasive, vascular, throughout, you know, all of them are the tight, small, dark holes. And one of those, open, one of those areas is the connection between the esophagus and the stomach. Um, that exists in the, what's called the hiatus, which is a small opening, um, a sort of a window into the, uh, into the chest cavity th from the abdominal cavity. Really all the operations that have benefited a tremendous amount from minimally invasive surgery are surgeries that occur there. And so in the old days, I remember still doing thoracoabdominal incisions for uh, anything up in that region. And what that thoracoabdominal incision is basically opening the chest and the abdominal cavity, taking down the diaphragm to f now see this little dark hole. Uh, I can get there through five millimeter incisions, which are about like half an inch or three quarters of an inch. Um, so. The operations that we do there have really taken um, taken advantage of the minimally invasive approach. Specifically though, I think uh, the total gastrectomy, which is a dramatically more abundant operation when done open, um, I successfully can, we can successfully do those operations both laparoscopically or robotically. Uh, it allows us to really trace the esophagus well up into the mediastinum, sometimes even right to below the carina. Um, and allows access to all the lymph node packets that may be living up there. It's, uh, it's really a tremendous thing to watch your patients the day after a big operation like that going for a walk. Yeah, it really is in in incredible. And the thing that's so interesting to me as a vascular surgeon that lived through the development of endovascular mm. is that endovascular is a fundamentally different way of taking care of vascular problems in which we work within the blood vessel. Mm -hmm. Whereas minimally invasive surgery is able to do the exact operation uh, that you would do open, but just do it through a minimally invasive approach, which I is very interesting and, and uh, allows a, a lot of applications. What's been interesting about the evolution over the last few, and so when I think about minimally invasive surgery, I think about the early pioneers, and so people like uh, you know my, my our friend uh, Dr. Phillips, who really did the operations using old er technologies like clips. You know, um, he didn't have a lot of the things we do have now. So I think we're now we're in a sort of a transition point where we can use um, augmented reality. So I not infrequently use a, a laser to light up um, endocyanin and green, a dye that we can give in the vein to see vessels. And so, yes, uh, it is exactly the same operation, but augmented by different technologies that we can now use to both look at uh, blood vessels, we can look at lymph nodes, and that's just the beginning of that era. And so augmented reality is really the next phase, I think, or information information management and augmented reality is really the next phase of what we're about to get uh, embark on. You know, I, I, I know that robotic uh, utilization is, is way up in general surgery. And uh, I wonder if you could explain what the advantages are of a robot versus mm -hmm. the more uh, traditional, <laughs> if I could use that word, mm -hmm. laparoscopic approach. Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a question we all sort of uh, sort of ask ourselves often because the robot what the robot has done is it's allowed for surgeons to um, predictably have good three three dimensional vision. Uh, so it it uh, because of the type of laparoscope or camera that's placed in the a in the abdomen has the ability to have three D three D visualization. Um, it allows for us to see things more easily, and instead of I, I was doing laparoscopic surgery for 12 years before I even touched the robot. And so I had trained both my brain and my hands to figure out three dimensions 
using cues of light or cues of how my hands moved in the abdomen. And all of a sudden, we went to 3D vision. Uh, and the first time I really recognized how important that was when I, it was, when it was when I was watching a younger surgeon do something that had taken me four or five years to figure out how to do. They did it the first time they, they touched the, the robot. And so it's, it's really um, an enabling device that really helps people become proficient with minimally invasive surgery who otherwise might not be able to do so. Um, I think that's one of the major advantages. And the other advantages, you know, were the fact that instead of having a straight stick in and out of the abdomen, like we have with laparoscopy, we have wrists at the end, which allow us to uh, access tissues that may not be easily accessible. In general, I think that the robot, the advantage of the robot is really for the generations that are coming up, it allows them to be able to perform minimally invasive operations without having to go through five years of learning how to do those operations. They can basically get on the console and start right away, not right away, but with it, with some help and some proctoring, et cetera, get good at it. And I've seen that in our trainees, the, the, the fact that they make operations look beautiful that took me 10 years to figure out how to look beautiful. And it's, uh, it's a point of pride for me to watch them do those things. Um, I know that they're leaving our training program and uh, they're gonna be able to offer those same high quality operations to their patients in the community. And it's <coughs> my understanding that there are tremendous, what you might call ergonomic advantages to using a robot instead of uh, the routine uh, laparoscopic technique. Yeah, I think one, uh, one uh, um, sort of little secret amongst minimally invasive surgeons is that we've all been through physical therapy. <laughs> I've been through physical therapy twice. Uh, one of my friends, Nat Soper, has been through physical therapy at least four or five times. Um, and you know it, it, it's going to uh, elongate the career of all of our sur of our of all our surgeons, and hopefully you know, also make it so that our younger surgeons don't have to ever deal with that kind of thing. So, how do you deal with the problem that you know, that as we alluded to before, you grew up doing open operations and evolved into doing minimally invasive uh, surgery, mm -hmm. such that when you encounter a problem that can't be dealt with minimally invasively, you've got years of experience doing open operations. But uh, now, since the vast majority of things like gallbladders and other procedures are done laparoscopically, mm -hmm. how are the younger people in our field going to develop the expertise uh, without the experience of having done many open procedures? I think that's the, it sort of typifies the importance of mentorship and having colleagues. Uh, I think, um, you know, lots of the operations we d I still can't do every operation laparoscopically and so i still do about five percent of my operations open and i think those are the times when we bring everybody in to sort of look at what we're doing uh, a good example is colonic interposition it's taking the colon um, and converting it into an esophagus essentially and that's it's a very complicated operation it takes a lot of time and experience but it's just not something we can r yet do robotically or laparoscopically and when those cases come around we make sure that everybody comes to sort of see how we're doing it but um you know i have faith <laughs> i have faith in the system i have faith in the people that we've graduated in over the last 15 to 20 years that um the mentorship will be there in the community to help people learn how to do these operations open I guess years ago people said, you know, how can you give up horses for cars? You know, if you really need a horse, well, you won't know how to ride them. Mm -hmm, but it right. hasn't worked out quite like that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the argument was also even when laparoscopy was first being um, utilized, people said the same thing. You know, if, uh, eventually people aren't going to know how to do open operations. And we rescue ourselves all the time from laparoscopic surgeries doing open operations. So I think, um, yeah. I mean, I'm, if somebody wants to ride their horse around, that's cool, but it's going to be a little tough with all the cars in the way. So let me close with a, a personal question. I hope it's not too invasive. Uh, we're talking about minimally invasive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know that you and your wife have kids and, and you both work. And uh, I wonder in this day of uh, all the challenges that we're dealing with, what lessons have you learned about how to maintain your family time and maintain your balance in life? Uh, despite the fact that you've got a, a huge practice and many other responsibilities here at Cedar sinai <laughs> That's the hardest question you've asked. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the last two years have been challenging for all of us, and I think that when we face challenges like this, you sort of go back to the foundations of what make you feel whole. Um, I've had to, in the last couple of years, go back a couple of times to figure out why, ask myself, why did I go to medical school? Why did I want to become a doctor? which has helped me in prioritizing the things I've got to do. 
but you don't get to ask why did I become a father I guess because it's part of the things you did and I think but uh, the reality is is that um, I got we all have to recharge our batteries and the way I recharge my batteries honestly is being with my family and watching my young children um, they understand the sacrifices that we sort of have given for this career but they also understand that at the end of that sacrifice is another person who's benefiting um, so I think my kids have been really, really good about that. And I think that they spending time with them on the weekends completely recharges my batteries. Have any of your kids uh, uh, evinced any interest in going into medicine? <laughs> my, um, so my oldest kid is nine, and he said, yeah, I'm, I would be interested in medicine. I'm definitely not going to become a surgeon, though. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. Miguel, listen, we're very appreciative of all the terrific work that you do here not just in taking care of your patients, but also educating our young surgeons and look forward to many more years here uh, for you at Cedars-Sinai. Thanks for being here today. Uh, absolutely, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.